This new, next book, look how big it is. Hot off the press, we were worried it wasn't going to get here in time. They opened the box up, it just got here, and this is the first copy out of the box. So I told them it is. <laughs> the only problem is it's not. Brand new, hot off the press. <laughs> But before Guy starts, I want to tell you the story behind this book. Now, we published two of Guy Needler's books. He'll be talking about those on Sunday. Correct, yes. And he'll also be doing workshops. So we had already contacted with Doc, Guy to do the book, The History of God. Well, this book came in, also from England. And it was so huge, it's, I'm sorry to say it sat there for a while before I was even going to get a chance to look at it and read it. Because I read everything that comes in, and we get hundreds and hundreds of manuscripts. When I first read it, it blew me away because it has the history of everything in it. And um, well, the part that's so strange about this is when we contacted the author, was talking to him about, you know, we'd like to publish it, want to send you a contract. He said, you're already publishing my son-in-law's books. He said, what? Now imagine the country the size of England, and we've got two people that are related. They didn't know, but it was, it was a guy's, it was Anne's father that wrote the book and sent it in. So we went ahead and worked with them. But I want Ann to tell you the struggle he went through to write this book. How long has it been since he died? Just a few months? Uh, seven months. But seven months ago he died. He's never got to see it. But he spent his whole life, didn't he, doing this. Tell, I want Ann to tell the story of how it came about. Thank you. She's a little shy, but that's all right. <laughs> Thank you. Dad would have been so proud because this is all his life's work. He's published two books before this, which Guy will mention. But this all comes from work that started in, in the 1960s. And he did some, published one book, did some more, published another, and then carried on. And finally, this is the culmination of it all. And I mean, I remember when I was young, when I was five or six years old, he would bring his uh, research team home in the evenings to sort of carry on working. And then, you know, he got older and older when he got to 67. No way was he going to retire because he was just so interested in this stuff. And he wasn't egotistical about it at all. He just wanted the, the information to be out there in case it was useful to anybody. So 67 came, he carried on going. He did cut down to four days a week. 70 came, he carried on going. He, I think he cut down to three days a week. 86, he was still working on this. My brother helped him at the end put, put it together with the computer. But Dad learned how to use it so he could put it together. And he was, um, he was 89 when he died last November. So this was just meant everything to him. And he was so delighted when he got the phone call from Dolores saying that Ozark would publish it. And he would have wanted to thank them very much. Well, he said, uh, didn't he try? He sent it out to publishers. Yes. He was trying to marry metaphysics with science to show they were what related or that what just, you to wanted, just to show to just show the proof, similarity basically. between proof, yeah. science and metaphysics but he said even the scientists wouldn't even listen to him would they no no he had um when he was working at, at the university he was a, a trained physicist the guy i'll tell you that and um, his, his own, own particular um, field was welding. The people, the head of department allowed him to do this extra work, metaphysical work, in the department, as, but with the proviso that he wouldn't promote that. He, you know, he would normally have got a promotion because he would actually did very good work, I'll tell you, in the mainstream science. So, um, but that didn't bother Gad. He gave up his promotion, but that didn't bother him. So the scientists, they allowed him to do it. That's what mattered to him. They gave him the space to do it, but um, they, were, they were a bit kind of, you know, they weren't that interested. But it got done, and I'm sure he's here kind of watching. I'm sure it was him that got the, book, the bo box just here. In <laughs> just, just in time. Just in time. So thank you. But it's got pictures. It covers... 
every phase of science and every phase of metaphysics, you imagine the work that went into this is a man's life work. But then we were over there last year and you said he died just about that time. But he knew it was it was going to it was after it was going to be published. It was the easiest book we've done. I didn't have to do a thing to it. It's enormous. And it was perfect. But he died before he got to see it. But like he said, he's here. We know he is. And that, that's quite a story behind it. Yeah. We did manage to show him the cover. So um, Dennis was in his, um, basically in his last days on Earth. And he, um, he, was in the hospital. he was in the hospital. And we'd just seen the, uh, the cover on Amazon. It had been put on Amazon as a pre-order. And I took, a, it, took an image off that and blew it up and showed him it in the, in the hospital. And the, uh, you know, his eyes <laughs> were watery. So he was dead pleased that he was going to carry on. And uh, he'd be very, very pleased to see you all here now and to see this uh, being handled by, actually, and being published by somebody who he really respected deeply. Oh, he, he never he, met he, us, it was just uh, phone calls. Yeah, yeah really, really respect, we really respect, respect you. He, got, he had all your books, by the way. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, that just reminded me that I got into metaphysics at an early age because Dad was interested in it. And the first books he gave me were Dolores Cannon, uh, Jesus and the Essenes, and I, I Walked with Jesus. And, and so he really, really did respect Dolores. And thank you very yeah, much for publishing on, yeah. his book. <laughs> But what are the odds in a country the size of England that we're going to run into two people that are related and ended up making contracts with them and not even knowing that they were in the same family? That's it. And then here he's coming to the end of his life and it's like it had to be done. He was trying to So that's that's the amazing way the universe works. Okay, so Guy is going to talk about his father-in-law's work in this lecture. Then he'll be talking about his own, his own work on, on Sunday. So um, just a little bit more history about this, this book. It's absolutely biblical in size and the information. And um, the presentation I'm going to give now is, is, is in essence the information that I think pinpoints um, some of the main areas of the book that give the evidence for the greater reality of spirit. Um, in actual fact, the, the, I, I can't do anywhere near enough justice to the book in the presentation because it's, it's got so much data and information in there. So if this presentation gives you an idea of some of the information that's in there and the evidence in there for, for spirits, then, then I'm, I'm, I'm pleased about that. One thing to note is that although I knew Dennis 27 years and I've been married to my wife for 25 years next April, so that's 25th anniversary, um, and we talked about metaphysical information, data, inf uh, and, and different genres of information. I never really got to the depth of what he was doing himself. And although when I first met Anne, I was you know, cognizant of the two books, The Limb of Creation and The Explosions of Consciousness, of which part some of this, some of this, some of this book, the, uh, Cosmos. I was more interested in his daughter, actually, than the information that was, that was in his book. So, so um, you can imagine my delight researching the book and researching some of the articles that Dennis gave to see some of the correlation with my own work. And I'm going to try my best to point those out when I go through this presentation, because it's important, because some of the information that Dennis was getting correlates totally with, with, with what I've been getting, but from a slightly different angle, depending upon the information and, the, and how the people were working. But also, it correlates with the information a hundred years ago. And I'll go through that as we go through. So if we can uh, show some of the information on the slide, please, uh, please, John. So this is, uh, this is Dennis. And you can see he looks much better than me. He's a much, much uh, prettier looking individual. So I'm going to go through a short history of uh, Dennis Milner. And I'm going to touch what I've called the four corners of Cosmos, which are those areas that give a good idea of what's the, the physical evidence, the scientific evidence, that's, that's provable to show that um, the greater reality of, of spirits exist. So I'm going to go through the registration of etheric force activity, an evolutionary holistic view on creation, simple technique for unraveling the atom, and the basis for homeopathy and why it works. Now, 
Dennis in his late teens joined the RAF in the latter half of the Second World War. Having survived that period, he returned back into civilian life. And the, the, the UK government at that time were offering servicemen and women the opportunity to go back into education if their education was interrupted by the, by the war effort. And Dennis took this opportunity to take a grant and he went to Queen Mary College uh, University in London to study physics. Now he went to study physics because he thought that it would give an answer to the questions he was asking whilst in in the war effort and, uh, and everything else that was going on in terms of people working together and for, for a single cause and, and why the, the whole universe was there. Now, after he finished his degree, he went to work at Birmingham University and worked in a metallurgy uh, unit. And I think mid-70s, he managed to get a doctorate of science, a DSC. Now, a DSC is awarded to those individuals who make a significant uh, piece of work towards that subject matter that they're working with. Significant contribution. So a DSC is significantly higher in reality to a PhD. So to get that from somebody who was you know, basically an ordinary individual who just got his, his degree as a result of a grant, he would do extremely well. But throughout this, this time, he realized that he couldn't explain other physical processes, such as how he felt when he was in the war, how he felt working with his comrades, the spirit about working together, working as a one, working together towards a common goal, working with total disregard for self, but working for the benefit of others. So together with a colleague of his, Ted Smart, they embarked upon the additional research, you know, additional to their uh, metallurgy work, to investigate the meaning of life. Now, Dennis and Ted made significant process uh, over the years. And, and around about the middle 70s, they gave a number of lectures to demonstrate what they'd achieved. And within those, some of those early lectures, there was two, two individuals. One was a publisher, and one was the owner of Nielsen's. And Nielsen's, for those of you who don't know, are the homeopathic uh, company in the UK. And, he had, and this, this, this gentleman who owned Nielsen's, the founding, founding owner, CEO, he had a foundation. And he offered them money to continue their researches. So in 1976, that first publisher published their first book, Loom of Creation, which identified all of the work they'd done to date. And they gained the funding from Nielsen's to take on board three young researchers, Brian Meredith, Andrew McNeil, and Harry Dean, to progress the work. They continued along the, the lines that they'd previously started with Dennis and Ted, but continued into other areas as well. And in mid-80s, these are mid-80s, they published the next book, The Explorations of Consciousness. Now, being young and just finishing their PhDs, the amount of money ran out eventually, and uh, Brian, Harry, and, and, and Andy left. Although they'd done the equivalent of 19 man years between them, it wasn't inconsiderable. So Dennis and Ted continued the work, gradually putting together all of that information that, that they got in between explorations of consciousness and where they were currently. Ted sub subsequently passed away, and Dennis continued, forming that manuscript that became Cosmos. And in 2006, he self-published. The problem was, it wasn't really going anywhere. So during 2010, it was presented to, to Ozark for the opportunity to be published. And luckily, in 2011, it was accepted. 23rd of November, 2011, Dennis, full of the knowledge that his, his work was going to continue, decided to go back into the energetic and, and left us leaving me to do this presentation. <laughs> okay, so in the first start of the, the work that Dennis and Ted did, they started to look at what, was going, what had happened in the past in terms of spiritual research, and they focused upon the imagery that was there. Now, they understood that mystics and clairvoyants had identified that everything animate and inanimate had an energy field around them, an etheric field, and they knew that certain individuals had, had been able to capture this, so within the metallurgy department of Birmingham University, they decided to do some extra research and work with this. And one of the first pieces of evidence they had that they, that they established from the old texts was this work by Dr. Baraduck, who captured the auric field around a human hand. Dennis and Ted decided to work on another method, similar to curling photography and they registered the auric phenomena around privet leaves 
by putting them in between a sandwich of between photographic plates and then metal plates either side, and then charging those plates with the high voltage. And you can see these are some of the first images they got. But you can see the auric, the field around it. This is the etheric, okay? And these little dots are identified as being prana. And you can see with these three privet leaves here, there's an interface between the three auric layers, forming a, a single auric layer. In this instance, you can see that the, there's, there's other forces happening as well. And I'm going to talk about this later, but these three leaves appear to be serving one another to create a single etheric field. Now, other psychics such as uh, Phoebe Payne and uh, Eileen Garrett have made note of the fact that they've been able to see the, the auric layer around certain inanimate objects. And uh, Barbara Brennan suggests in her book, Hands of Light, that on a nice sunny day you can lie on the grass, look at the leaves and, and the trees, and look at the prana moving around, the white globules of energy moving around the, the tops of the trees. You can also, in a nice sunny day, put your fingers together. Okay? And you can see the energy moving between the two fingers quite easily. And if you just focus your eyes, you can see little sh dots flying around. And that's called the orgone, which is another energy set. So they extended their electrophotography, as they called it, researches, and built a power source. And a chap called Michael Watson created a bigger and better power source for them to create better results. The problem was that if they were registering what clairvoyance and mystics were saying, was, it, was there, with was these auric fields and, uh, and energy fields, then how was this happening? And on the basis that plant activity could be associated with the effect surrounding energy fields, they tried to create disturbances in there to see what was happening. And, they, and this happened as well. They, they, they worked well. And they found that they didn't need to have a photographic emulsion to do it. They could do... Uh, they could get a registration by applying something very similar to, to the, what we call photocopying now. Where they applied a powder across the bottom plate, put the sandwich together, applied a, a potential voltage, and then they, in a low, low powered microscope, looked at the images that were there. Now, in this instance, they used a positive and negative terminal to take some images. And you can see here, we can show the. Um, if you can show the slides, John. Okay. Okay. So this is a negative term, this is a positive turbo. And Dennis described this as being a, a suctional effect, which acts with, and the suctional effect is because it looks like a root system. And this is a, an expansive effect, which looks like it's very thick. And you can see that when they're far off apart, there's no influence. But when you get two negative terminals together, you can see there's a, a battle happens between the two fields. They try to repel each other. And this is interesting because this is similar to how the two south poles or the two north poles of a magnet, when pushed together, would start to repel each other. So what I think they were looking at there was the etheric version of magnetic field. And the same here with the, with the, with the positive field, where the two uh, fields are, are battling against each other and trying to fight apart. But look at this interesting part here. The negative and the positive fields together are trying to attract each other and work together and pull each other together which is similar to what a magnet does on the north and south poles. And this is another image here. And you can see that um, this is a nice feather type effect that they captured and a, and, a, and a daisy type effect here. And this is interesting shape, and we can see that later in uh, some of the other registrations they had. And this was created by putting a hot metal stud on a, a wet uh, paper in between the sandwich of the, the um, assembly they were using to create this imagery. Now, I think that what they've hit on, on here is part of an etheric template, an etheric template of the plant kingdom. Because if you see here, this looks like the tops of trees, and this looks like the root systems of trees. And this would be the center of the earth, with the energy there. So oh, this is quite an interesting phenomenon. So when they were using this technique of electrophotography, they started to understand what was going on and the significance of the results that it produces. For example, what these show about the nature of space around animate and inanimate objects. And they referred to the fact that Dr. John Piriakos, and for those of you who know um, the Pathwork series with Susan and Donovan Tasenga, you will know that they worked with Eva and John Piriakos and 
uh, Barbara Brennan back in the early 70s to understand some of the other um, greater pieces of information about the greater reality. But Dr. John Periakos originally started to use filters to try to see the human energy field and later developed the ability on itself. So if you can see this next slide here, you can see that here there's the prana on the outside and there's the energy field around the privet leaves. But you can see the flow around the outside. You can see the flow around the outside here. So they were stating there that there was energy flow happening as well as static energy around those fields. Now when the three young lads, Andy, Harry and Brian, came on the team, they decided to change direction slightly and move into a different form of research, one that was more in keeping with the 70s. And as some of you can probably remember, there was a lot of talk about LSD and how it can enhance your consciousness. But there was other levels of consciousness that could be achieved without, without drugs, and they researched into that. Theoretical physicist Paul Daniels reviewed phenomena that show a creative power and a self-organizing ability in nature. And he concluded that it wasn't possible to explain these in terms of molecules and interatomic forces. And there must be something else going on. But when you look at the, the evidence from mystics and clairvoyance, they explain why it happens, but the problem is they're vague because there's no physical evidence to support it. So Dennis and Ted and the team decided to in, investigate how they could prove it. And whilst they were doing this, they came upon the work of Rudolf Steiner. And this was the most comprehensive account of, of information that they got. And Steiner suggested that there was a hierarchy of spiritual beings working in a cosmic ether to implement the plan of a remote, awe-inspiring Godhead. And that all forms came about as a result of four etheric forces. So I don't know if any of you read, read any of Steiner's work, but it's particularly difficult to get one's head around, and they had the same problem. But they kept this in mind as a, as a datum point for moving on. They found it comparatively easy to achieve an expanded uh, awareness state and got plenty of insights and images as a result. And these pieces of, pieces of data could be comparatively mundane or seemingly from a source of, of great wisdom, depending upon the nature and quality of their questioning or what the source of that information seemed to think they needed to know. In these expanded consciousness experiences, and I'll call them ECEs from now on, the other members of the group entered the, the expanded consciousness state, and Dennis, being the scientist that he was, acted as the guide to direct the questions. Now, the first insights were concerned mostly about the inner problems and personal development of, of those, uh, those people going to expanded consciousness. And they started to ask questions later about what they were getting in these, uh, these, these images that they'd taken about energy and auric fields around plants. What was, what was apparent, though, is that they seemed that they'd established a contact with intelligences that could in some way perceive the workings of these forces and had a larger and deeper vision of the workings of the universe. And they consulted with these entities for many times, but they couldn't get a completely satisfactory explanation for their, their results. But then they had a, an image of what was Rudolf Steiner come into the mind of uh, one of the researchers, Harry, saying that they need to bring the Christ force into their work. And Harry said, I have an image of Steiner the link is very strong between him, or them, and us. But there's something we've got to do. We have to open ourselves up and bring the Christ force into our resources. Now, at that point in time, none of them had got any religious tendencies at all. They were all Church of England, which is about as close to being atheist as you can get. <laughs> okay? So, so this was quite a revelation for them. Also at that point in time, the words Christ force and, you know, Christ's energy wasn't really prevalent and being used as a, as a piece of known nomenclature. So it was quite strange. Within these ECE, Harry went on to measure, to mention that the Christ force and the Christ path is not really mystical or holy, although those are the sorts of feelings that we start to in, in, invoke when we, we work with it. So it's not like that. It's a very practical, down-to-earth sort of energy. The Christ path is a very patient path. It waits for people to join it. And he got the picture that the Christ force didn't assert itself. It's there, but it fades into the background. It's waiting for you to make your own decisions to join it and start to work with the Christ energy or the energy that's surrounding and associated with the, the, 
the greater reality or God. So at first, the ECEs that they did, these expanded consciousness experiences, pursued Steiner's viewpoint that everything happened according to a plan of a remote Godhead. I use the word remote here, remote Godhead. But after this, their ECEs portrayed an all-embracing Godhead who evolves through his creation. And in an ECE that Brian had, he said, we thought about the Godhead being something untouchable, incomprehensible, unapproachable. But we don't need to. We are tiny, but we are part of the Godhead. We are part of him. He's in evolution himself. He doesn't know what he's going to do or how it's going to go on. And that he's in, in, as, in it as much as, as we are. Because we are him. It's not chaotic, there's order, and a specific way of things. Now I found this really interesting, because the idea of having a Godhead and we're part of it totally correlated with the information that I was getting. We are all one. We are part of our creator. We are individualized units of our creator, and our creator is an individualized unit of its creator, the origin, or the absolute. And I was really excited when the next set of information came out. Now, Dennis and Ted and the group found the idea of everything consisting of an all-embracing, evolving Godhead very difficult to grasp. Because although they were given various governing principles, they were difficult to, to comprehend. And that's a, a function of the Steiner uh, methodology, by the way. Now, they made very little progress in understanding their, their idea of a creator Godhead until it was replaced by an absolute. When Ted had an ECE that portrayed the beginning of physical activity by the absolute. And again, I was extremely excited when I read this. Bear in mind that there's been many years in between me doing my work and, and Dennis and Ted and the guys doing their work. And Ted said, I'm drawn back to the stage when it's all one. There's a vast, quiet nothingness. Then parts of it begin to move. Parts of it arise and collapse. Then somewhere, somewhere else in the center, the center arises for a brief moment. And that part is outside. That part that's outside of it witnesses the turmoil. And with this comes into the appreciation of its raw potential. It's not a case of thinking about what can be made and then assembling the materials to do it. It happens the other way around. The absolute gets to know itself and then it recognizes what it can do. And this is something it develops as it goes along. This is exactly what I was picking up on my own. That initially, when the origin became self-aware, it was this vast tract of space, energy, dimension, plane, continuum, whatever you want to call it. And a very small part of it, a very small part of it, had enough, let's call it mass, to start to gain that essential content to allow it to become self-aware. This was showing exactly the same thing, and I was really excited about this. So according to this viewpoint, everything is part of an absolute energy, which starts in a dormant and conscious state, and then experiences a succession of impulses, or what they call eruptions of activity. Spurts of interest, spurts of self-awareness. And as the absolute develops, it becomes aware of and learns to control its eruptions. These become a coherent rhythm of activity, as portrayed in one of Andy's ECEs. And here, Andy talks about what, what, what went on. He's in an ECE, and all of a sudden he sees Christ's hands in front of him. And they're offering strength and support. And he said he felt himself moving towards a vantage point where he could see everything. A bit like being on this podium there, seeing all you guys. Okay? He was in a still center. Then he saw a gateway into a garden. And Christ beckoned him into this garden. But to get into this garden, there was a doorway. And as he moved through the doorway, he said, I felt parts of me being left behind. Fears, prejudices, weaknesses, all of the baggage that would stop him from communicating with such a pure soul. He said, Christ and I are sitting on benches facing each other. He said, what do you want to know? Now this is interesting because all of the work I did in preparation to do the, ch the channeling work, part of the Brennan Healing Science and Energy Healing, everything there was pointing towards you need to be pure. And Michael, Michael mentioned this earlier in his, in his own presentation. You need to be pure to be working with that which is pure because you can't include your own prejudices, your own intellect, your own interpretation. It has to be pure. And when it's pure, you're allowed to work with it. Now, in this instance, Dennis acts as the guide and asks the question and asks about the fact that they've been led to a Godhead and given a variety of images. 
He wanted to know whether these were purely steps along the way and whether they could now concentrate on an absolute. And in this ECE, and he says, Christ stepped away to reveal a powerful blaze of golden light so that it was face to face with the absolute. And he said he could see the absolute with the great cloak of his creation spread about him. He takes everything in and analyzes it. I feel some kind of dissatisfaction. He feels the absolute's dissatisfaction. There's tension, impatience, a sense of something unresolved. And he's picking out all the unresolved things he wants to work on. And he came to the conclusion that the absolute is perfecting the creation that's already there, as well as advancing new creation. It's an endless process. And as fast as the absolute is able to reach out and make a perfect creation, there's always more further out, which is growing in a disharmonious way. This was very interesting to me because when I was communicating with the origin, it told me about its area of self-awareness. It's only aware of its own backyard. It knows there's a big world out there. It knows there's a big galaxy out there. It knows there's a big universe out there. It knows there's a multiverse out there, which is it. But it's only starting to map its own backyard. And it's moving in certain directions only. So it's not moving in a, in a holistically spherical direction. It's moving in certain areas where it wants to go, where it finds things not working properly. So it's almost like a, a very old, partially deflated balloon where it's not particularly sp spherical. It's got little lumps and bumps everywhere. And that's how the, the origin started to, and in this instance, the, what they call the absolute, started to evolve and press itself out further and further to understand itself. Now, based upon previous information, Dennis asked a question about whether one of these turns, these turns, these eruptions, these changes, these advancements, is our universe, our physical universe. The response from Andy was during this ECE that our universe is but the twinkling of the eye of this figure. It's not even the twinkling of the eye. It is extremely minute time-wise. But according to this ECE, our, our, our universe is one of a succession of universes, each of which develops out of and realizes new potentials in the previous one, by which the totality, the absolute, evolves in stages. Now, when I looked at that, I looked at how our own source entity, our own God, had created a multiverse. In the history of God, the source entity stated that he copied a certain amount of structure of the origin to work with. And when we look at the structure of the multiverse, each of the multiverse, each, each of the universes, the simultaneous universes, are a higher frequency to each other. They're a progression from each other. Each one is a progression from the other one. Each one leading towards evolution, getting closer towards the Godhead, getting closer towards being one in communion with the source entity. And this was saying exactly the same thing. Now later on in their, their, their work, their experimentation, they started to combine the information or the methodologies that they used to gather in, information via the electrophotography with the expanded consciousness techniques to try and if you like, compare the two together and get some correlation with what was going on. So, they, Dennis describes in the book how they, their electrophotography appeared to register auras around leaves and etheric forces forming shapes. And this was just an example of what was out there. They also knew that, he, that the same auras were around the human body and around other animals as well. But one of the other levels of phenomena that they managed to register were things called activity tracks. And this led them down a, com a completely different path. These were registered by using a change in the, the assembly of the electrophotography technique. And they put a wet filter paper in the sandwich arrangement and used a, a lower voltage of 5,000 volts compared to that which they previously used, which was uh, 15,000 volts. And they also used a longer dwell time. So they kept the voltage on for longer than 10 seconds, typically 30 seconds, to gain the imagery. And this next image is a, is, is, is a, is a really good example of that which was there. And if John can show me the next image, it'd be great. So this is a fantastic image of what they picked up by using that methodology. And this is like a sun image with an outer parameter. Outer parameter. And all of these areas here are the activity tracks. And these are extremely important. And I'll, I'll, I'm going to refer back to these again in the next uh, part of the presentation. Although you can't see it, these are very small heart-shaped objects all linked together, all around here. And they're all uncurling, 
Okay? And there's other areas here as well, which I'll try and make out if I can. Around here, these little fan-shaped images as well, which are also quite interesting, because these show up in a piece of older information that two of the researchers created. To try to understand what they were seeing, they would refer to the work of two individuals that were experimenting in the 1900s, Besant and Ledbetter, to try and understand what was going on. Now, Besant and Ledbetter claimed to be able to enter into a state of consciousness by a technique taught to them by Indian yogis, or mystics, in which they could will back the environment around an atom, okay, and strip it apart, and open it up, allowing them to, to understand and see the internal structure. And they discovered that the physical atoms were comprised of much smaller etheric atoms. Mm, not quite quarks, but we'll get there in a moment. And that the basis of all substance are based upon two ultimate atoms. And if the origin of these ultimate atoms, described by, by the Sanskrit name of Anu, is traced further back, then one can enter into the spiritual or the astral world. And in this, this next slide, uh, these are images or sketches that Besant and Lebetta made to show these Anu. And these are like a left hand, right handed particle, if you like. There's uh, an anti clockwise rotation to this spiral and a clockwise rotation to this spiral. And the one Anu has spiritual energy moving into it, and the other Anu has spiritual energy moving out of it. So they are the, the yin and the yang of each other, they work together. They exist together, which is another interesting piece of information. Now, what Besant and Ledbetter recognized was that these, types, these two types of Anu are combined together in various numbers and configurations to form a second level of etheric atoms. That second level itself was combined together to create a third level of atoms, which was combined together as well to create a fourth level, etc., etc which created a gaseous condition. In this way, Besant and Ledbetter claim that physical atoms comprise of large numbers of Anu, these smaller basic fundamental units. The Anu are organized and grouped together in various ways to form the atoms of higher etheric levels. And the higher etheric atoms are in turn grouped together to form the physical atoms. So you can see there, there's an awful large amount of structural work going on before we even get to a physical atom. So the spiritual essence, the spiritual substructure is quite complicated. So on the basis that creation goes through the cycles of, of development in which each cycle is a universe, is created and it is reworking an extension of the previous one, this is how the complex atomic structures have been built up. And Bissant and Ledbetter described the structures of all of the elements in the periodic table from these, uh, these in you. They found out that hydrogen, one of our most basic components, had and was built above 18 in you. And when they looked at other elements with many tens or, or hundreds or thousands or tens or hundreds of thousands or even millions of in you, if they divided that figure by 18, they could predict the atomic weight that was known by man. And in this way, they predicted the atomic weight of all the periodic table, the elements of the periodic table at that point in time. Bearing in mind this is the 1900s, the early 1900s. They also predicted a number of different elements that weren't available to mankind at that point, such as certain radioactive isotopes and alloys, such as titanium, uh, cobalt, and all those sorts of different things. Uranium. So they were really were picking up the basic information from the spirit. Next, on the next slide, you can see some chains of activity. And some of these chains of activity or traces were correlated to what uh, Besant and Ledbetter described in their work. Now, remember, I talked about these little heart shaped uh, traces. And there they are. Okay. Those are anew. Yeah. Those are the fundamental building blocks of an atom. And they go they're there and around there, and then this spiral form here, which is really quite interesting. This was taken 30, 30 odd years ago. Yeah. This is splitting the atom down to its fundamental components, well below that which mankind's done with large hadron colliders, by the way. 
The problem was at this moment in time, they were using terminology that Steiner had given them. Okay? And they used the words light ether being to describe electrons or photons because that's what Steiner was looking at and how he described them when he was working with them. So, with these images ready and waiting, they went into expanding consciousness techniques to try and understand more information about what was happening. And Dennis asked if Ted, who was in the expanding consciousness at that time, to look at the sandwich and look at the formation of the chains and try to understand what was going on. Now bear in mind, this was all done in a sandwich with water there. The, what, was, what Ted was doing was getting himself into in between these plates. He was putting himself into that spiritual area that was in between these plates. So Dennis asks, can you get a picture of the water molecules inside the sandwich? And Ted says, yes. I'm in the gap in between the sandwich. I'm surrounded by hundreds of thousands of water spears. These were the molecules of water. So Dennis asks, can you look at this, the disintegration process forming the chains as described as you go along? So what, happened, what was happening here was they were going into an experiment where they were going to energize one of the plates and look at what happened to those water spheres. In essence, Ted describes the process. They switch the, the power on, and at the top of the plate, electrons are projected outwards. Some of those electrons bounce off the water spheres, some of them go in between the water spheres. But the ones that hit the water spheres break it open and start the atom to unwind, start all the components of the atom to unwind. And this image here gives you an example of the, the plate. As you can see there, that's the, uh, the assembly. Okay. okay. That's the assembly there, metal plate. That's the photographic plate, the top plate, which is energized. That particular line there shows an uh, electron hitting one of the water spheres and shows the atom unwinding and gradually placing those heart-shaped objects, those are new, along the photographic plate. So this is the way that Ted's ECU portrayed the atoms. Okay. So in this, whilst in this state, Dennis is the guide, asked the question. When you see an atom of hydrogen, you see a sphere with coiled up chains surrounded by individualized beings. These are the photons and the, the electrons. Ask is that if that is an actual atom or a symbol. And the information that came back was quite interesting because in this ECE, Ted said it's symbolic. Although the, symbolic, the symbolism is, is quite close to what's reality, mankind can't possibly conceive the detail surrounding what's really going on. So, we're going to have to work harder to understand the detail behind what was being shown there. For, for, but the, what was being given to them is that spirits were allowing mankind to, to understand the greater reality in a way you can understand it at this point in time. And that happens a lot with everything we do. Okay. So, later on, Dennis asks... Ted to look at those spheres to understand what was going on with the water. Because in this experiment, the spheres were round. But science tells us that water is produced from two hydrogen atoms and one oxygen atom. And they, they glued together by their attractive forces. So science sees them as three. Now in this image here, Ted said that actually we're seeing it as a single sphere. When he asked the question later about what was going on inside, those atoms that were there previously still retained their individuality. There were still two hydrogen atoms there. There was still, so still one hydrogen atom. There's still two oxygen atoms there. Or two hydrogen. That's it. I think my chemistry now. <laughs> H2O. Yeah. There was still the right number in there, and they still got the roots. They still retained their own individuality, but rather than having three atoms stuck together, or particles stuck together, they became one. And the objective was that they became one together. They were serving each other with the common cause of becoming water particle. Now, Besant and Lebeter stated that when a compound was observed clairvoyantly, a mingling of the component parts of the atoms could be seen. And sometimes the atoms retained their individuality, and sometimes they were broken up. So, Dennis and the team wondered 
why this was and how that related to the way, the conventional way, science splits the atom. And then he said, Ted, can you imagine or can you visualize how man splits the atom? He said, impact a high energy particle on a piece of copper, a piece of copper foil, in a vacuum chamber, just as conventional science does, splitting the atom, and see what happens. And Ted said, well, it's very violent. It splits the, the water molecule, but it doesn't unwind that which is inside the atom gently, spreading it out. It completely destroys it. There is no unwinding. It's shattered everywhere, and the little heart-shaped objects that you knew are blown all over the place. So Dennis asked if science is doing something very bad when we split the atom. And the answer came back that, well, yes, we are. We're not working with nature. We're interfering with the natural order of things. But that man's allowed to do that because man is in the physical. And he has the freedom, the free will, to work with whatever means are available to him. So if he's developed along these lines, using these methods, then it's accepted. It's part of mankind's evolution. Now, unfortunately, and they never got around to carry on further research in this area, um, but even though this is quite a, uh, a small experiment, if we could use it just for unraveling the atom in this way, it would be much easier and much cheaper than using great big particle accelerators uh, over in Switzerland somewhere. Because actually, these guys were getting more information about the construct of an atom than they've ever got using particle accelerators. The interesting thing was here was that these structures can be observed by using homeopathic dilutions and that led them towards understanding or trying to work out whether there was a scientific basis for homeopathy and whether there was in fact something else going on from the greater reality. So a little bit of history. A group of medical doctors in Birmingham um, got together because they were disappointed with the fact that when they were giving a lot of their patients the medication, in many cases the medication was, was, being, was giving them more ailments and putting them in hospital more often than the actual problems that they got. But when they used homeopathic treatments, these would have dramatic effects, dramatic curative effects, getting them better, faster and without side effects. So they decided to set up a research team to try to understand what was going on and how home homeopathy worked and how it was a better solution to using allopathic methodologies that we currently use. And they, they understood and recognized the work that Dennis had done, so they asked him to become part of the team. Now, for those of you who don't know, home homeopathic methods, methods are based upon the massive dilution of the material that's being used in the, in the, in the cure. So, when a material, uh, let's say aurium um, or, or, uh, or privet or anything like that, or any plant that's being used, is diluted in, in, in water, there's an amount of that dilute, diluent taken out and then mixed with 10 parts water again and succussed, which is a particular form of uh, shaking and jolting, which is patented, I believe, by, by, uh, <laughs> by the Hilsons. Then, a part of that is taken out, and again, it's, it's diluted with 10 parts of water again, and then jolted and, 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 uh, and, and shake, shook again. And that's repeated time after time until, with a minimum of six dilutants or, poten or potentializations, you get the first level of homo homeopathic solution, which is um, this six times area, okay? There are more potent dilutions, which are 12 times, 30 times, 200 times, or even 1,000 times. Now, the critics of homeopathy claim that such highly diluted substances can't possibly do anything because there's not even a single molecule in the, in the remedy. It just appears to be water. But that criticism is based upon the understanding of the physical world and that the lowest common denominator at that point in time was the atom. Which, which you believe what it would be. But it wouldn't take account of other things like quarks, etc. But 
But looking at the information that uh, Ted and Dennis had uh, gained and, and the, the other team had gained, they worked out that such criticism is based upon, again, substance of atoms. But whereas, according to the viewpoint that an atom of a substance has been built upon the successive universes, as they called it, this and new being mixed together to create a, a, an etheric level, and then those etheric levels being mixed together to create a, another etheric level and being built up and built up and built up to eventually get to the point where it makes a, a physical atom, then if you unravel that atom the other way around, you start to get to the energy that created it, and therefore it would be more powerful. Now, Dennis and Ted uh, had a number of different images created from their electrophotography investigations, including this uh, homeopathic aurum, which is uh, aurum 12, which is 12 potentializations. And this shows some particularly interesting imagery here. Pay particular attention to this small daisy-like image there and these um, little leaves that are on the side here. They asked about those different images in one of the expanded consciousness techniques. And Dennis asked whether, in principle, it's possible to unwind atoms of any substance by potentializing them. And the answer was yes, from spirit. But interestingly enough, Besant and Ledbetter had described several benzene ring based phenol molecules. And these showed these fan like structures, and I'll go backwards so you can see this. These are this here, okay are these things here. And those little leaf shapes there is this area here. So what Ted and Dennis and the team were doing was actually capturing information that Besant and Ledbetter had captured through their own clairvoyance uh, consciousness t uh, techniques and, and had only been able to write it down and, and sketch it out to show what they were seeing. Dennis and Ted had shown actual evidence of what the Centre Nebato had done nearly 100 years ago. So, in another ECE, Ted asked about the homeopathic dilution. And he wanted to quantify whether this was in fact causing the atom to unwind. And the answer said yes. The image shows the water is very active with these light ether beings in there. So homeopathy, in effect, splits the atom. So it's linked with the, the other side of the presentation. So in, in effect, by splitting the atom and going down through these successive build-ups, what they call the universes, that create the physical atom, they're getting down to the core energy, the spiritual energy. And that's why homeopathy works. Okay? Whereas in reality, physical doctors can't see how it works because all they see is water. Now, quite interestingly enough, there is a strong anti-homeopathic element within the British medical industry, uh, in, despite, I think it's probably more than this now, despite the fact that about, at the point in time this, the, uh, the book is written, there's about 600 um, community service doctors using homeopathy alongside their standard uh, allopathic treatments. And uh, in a recent article, well, recent to Dennis, Cheryl Salmon reported using a homeopathic presentation as part of a protocol for treating obesity with great success with herself and 200 patients. That's above and beyond all of these other little tricks we've got. And that is the end. So in summary, Dennis realized that the human spirit affects most of what we do, specifically in times of personal crisis and stress, and that, this made him think there was something else going on. So his desire to understand more about the human spirit led to his creating a team of researchers. His scientific background allowed an impartial, analytical approach to investigating the evidence for the greater reality. With this team of like-minded and enthusiastic researchers, Dennis established and presented physical evidence for the greater reality of spirit. They established the method of the absolute process of becoming self-aware, 
which I was really pleased about when I read it because it collates totally with my information. And they established that the absolute is also subject to the process of evolution. In my information, the absolute investigated itself, experienced, learned, and evolved as a process, and wanted to ex accelerate that evolution, hence the creation of the source entities, and hence our source entity creating ourselves, so that it can experience the minute detail of itself by the creation of its other multiverse to support that. Their work is supported by previously reported scientific and mystic evidence. And Cosmos, as a book, is an excellent anthology of Dennis's own work, culminating the work from the, uh, the loom of creation and exp expressions of consciousness, plus additional work that Dennis and Ted had done after the expressions of consciousness had been published, and additional scientific and mystic evidence out there for the greater reality of spirit. And that's it. Thank you very much.